here and welcome everyone. I want to extend, first of all, our sympathies to the Carton family and the loss of Evelyn. And I know we have some of the family here today, so welcome. And as a church, we want to uh, extend our condolences to you. Um, last week I was saying about it being 2020 and how excited I was that, uh, you know, I thought 2020 was going to roll right off the end of my pen just as easy as not, but my first check went to be 2019. So, so much for that thought. But uh, I don't know, did anybody make a resolution this year? You've given up on that. Well, I was having a, a little conversation with Lily, uh, my cat, and uh, I told Lily about my New Year's resolution. Deb, do you have her reaction? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so much for resolutions. Um, ex especially this kind. Uh, it was supposed to be something with fitness and eating better and drinking more water and all that kind of thing. So I think Lily knows me a little bit better than I do. But anyway, coming into a new year in serving God is exciting. We have witnessed some really wonderful things in 2019. And I am excited about what 2020 holds. And so if we as a church and as individuals can resolve to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with whatever it takes, I think he would be pleased. And this morning, the worship team has chosen one of my favorite new courses. I don't know if it's new or not, but it's new kind of to me. And it comes from the book of Isaiah. Chapter 40, and the subtitle over the top of my text says, The Lord has no equal. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? Who is able to abide the spirit of the Lord? None of us. The Lord is waiting to advise us, and I'm excited about the new year. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be in your house and to be with your people. And Father, we just pray that your spirit, that you've called us here today, that your spirit would speak deeply into our hearts and draw us closer to you. And Father, may the worship that we offer to you today be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> And as you stand, would you stand and welcome each one to the house of the Lord.
pastors. The first time we did Alpha, our pastor was Dan Jamer. And we did it several times after that. And it is designed um, to be an outreach program. Uh, all you have to do is press the beginning. So it's a, it's a place, it's a safe place for people to explore faith in Jesus Christ. And it's, each session, as, as the promo said, it has food, uh, a talk, and a time to discuss what was uh, the main theme of that particular talk of that day. And it's designed initially was for people who were unchurched, uh, people who wouldn't necessarily consider themselves Christian. But it also can be used as well for people who are new in their faith and as well for people, any, it's actually for anybody. I remember taking Alpha the first time and the second time and the third time and every time I took it I got something new out of it. So it can be for anybody. And um, it's an opportunity, you can't really see all the way back there, to invite friends to hear the gospel and to explore a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard to invite people. I don't know why we're like that, but sometimes it is. I don't know if I'm the only person who ever finds that. But this is a natural way to invite people to a safe place where there's no judgment and that they feel very welcome to explore the hard questions in life. And um, there'll be more about it each week. So, Alpha, it's starting on Sunday, February 2nd. And I love our start date because it's 02-02-2020. So we're using up the, the twos and the zeros in our start date. And it's going to be at 5.30. That's on Sunday night. And it's designed to try to avoid all of the athletics and the hockey schedules and all the things that uh, go on in people's weeks. So we're trying to find a spot in the week where people can feel free to come. Ways that you can get involved. Number one, invite. Think of about people in the next week that you could be inviting to Alpha. Volunteer to be part of the team. And being part of a, a team like Alpha is a very rewarding thing. So maybe you might be thinking about being part of the team. And believe me, folks, everybody in this congregation this morning could have a role. There's a role for you. So, and the last thing is pray. So you can be involved by praying for this. Start praying right now. I asked you to pray last week. Really devote yourself to prayer for Alpha. We want to change this community. Now, in the next little while, you might be thinking about, well, how can I be involved? You said I could be involved, there's a job for me. And what are some of the things that I might be able to do? Hospitality is a huge piece of Alpha because it is so important that people, particularly people who may be fearful of coming into a church, feel welcome. So, as part of that, we need people who will be responsible and help out with the meal preparation because food is a large part of Alpha. It's a time to connect with people. It's a time to fellowship with people and to get to know them. So the food prep is huge. There's also a need for setup and takedown. We need people to be on the welcoming team, people who will help register people who come to Alpha and who will make them feel welcome the minute they step into our church. We need child care, and that's a huge one. <coughs> Transportation, because not only for people who uh, may not have transportation, but there may be some people in our church who will like to help out with Alpha, but maybe they're a little unsure about getting in their car at 5.30 on a Sunday night in the winter time. It might be more comfortable if somebody came and picked them up because they're a helper for Alpha. And publicity, getting the word out, getting posters out and put around our community. And also sound and video technology. Now, those are just some of them, but I don't want to give away the whole thing because next week there's going to be more. But your job this week is to be praying about Alpha, praying for the program, praying for the leaders, praying for people who will come, praying what God might lead you 
to do. <coughs> the children can go out to junior church if they would like to, and the rest of us will stand and say a blessed assurance.
And uh, Lord, we just thank you for Jesus Christ. That he makes life worth living and gives us purpose in life. And uh, Father, we thank you that uh, he is available to each one who will call upon him. And uh, we just, Father, thank you for what you're doing in our lives and through our lives. We pray this morning for uh, each one that's here. Father, that these past few weeks have been difficult in some in many ways. And some families that have lost loved ones, Father, we just pray that you would comfort them, strengthen them, encourage them. Father, it's never easy to lose someone that you know and love. And so we pray for those families, that you would just uh, encourage them. And Father, help us to be an encouragement to them as well. And Lord, for those that are struggling with illnesses, we lift them up to you today. We pray, Father, that you'd reach out and touch them. Uh, we just pray that you would uh, bring healing to their bodies. We think of the elderly ones, Father, that are struggling with the effects of aging. And Father, it's not always nice. It's not always kind. Um, but Father, it's there. And so we pray for them, those who would be here, uh, but are in nursing homes or at home or wherever, Father, because of uh, health reasons cannot. We pray that you would just bless them where they are today. Just guide and direct them. And Father, we, we do want to pray for our community. As we start into this new year and as Alpha starts and as we ourselves, uh, Father, listen to you and, and walk with you, we want, Father, to see many come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And many, uh, Father, who are going through life of just in the things of this world, caught up with the allurements that there are in this world, and Father, no lasting meaning. Uh, Father, we would long for them to come to know you and to see what life is really all about through the Lord Jesus. And so we pray for them this morning and lift them up to you, and we pray that you would help us to be instruments in your hands uh, in reaching out to them. We pray, Father, this morning for the missionaries that are around the world. As we read in our bulletin about uh, many of them who are living in difficult times and situations where they are, we pray that you would just uh, undertake for them this morning, too, that you would strengthen them and that you would encourage them and that you would, uh, Father, give them doors of opportunity and help them, Father, to be uh, accomplish that which you've sent them there to, to accomplish. And so, Father, we pray that you be with them. And Lord, we are so grateful that you are God, creator, sustainer of the universe, that there's no place in this universe that you aren't. And we are so grateful for that, because you can be with the missionaries around the corners of the world, you can be with us here right now. And so, Father, we thank you for who you are and what you are. We pray that as we look into your word, that, Father, it would be challenging to our hearts and to our lives. And that, Father, we would, in the days ahead, serve you in a way that's honoring to you and father challenging to us we pray in jesus name amen my scripture this morning is in philippians chapter one uh, three i'm sorry philippians, philippians chapter three we're going to read the, the chapter this is the apostle paul writing to the church at philippi Furthermore, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for this, such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith 
I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Let me ask you a question as we start this morning. Have you ever tried to look at your life the way God sees your life? Have you ever asked yourself, as God looks at me, what does he see in my life? Over the past number of years, especially the last two or three years, more and more, I find myself almost daily asking myself that question. God, when you look at my life, what do you see? Is it what you want it to be? Am I involved in the things you want me to be involved in, doing the things you want me to do? Am I spending the time wisely? Are you pleased as you look at my life? See, I cannot know, or you cannot know, the full mind of God. But we can know the heart of God. And in knowing the heart of God, we can see this world and the people of this world as God sees them. And that includes ourselves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 12, <clears throat> what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritual truths. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments, for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? And then there's a sentence that says this, But we have the mind of Christ. Now, I'd be the last person to even suggest or pretend that we could know the full mind of God. Not possible. God is so far beyond us. He tells us in His words, His thoughts are so far beyond our thoughts that we will never understand them. And we cannot know the full mind of God. But we can know the mind of God for our lives. We can know the mind of God for our individual lives, and we can know the mind of God for our church life. Because we have, by the power of the Holy Spirit living within us, the mind of Christ developing in us. And so we can know the mind of God. The question is, are we seeking to know 
the mind of God? That's the question. Not whether our God will reveal himself or, or not reveal himself to us. He says in Jeremiah 29 verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And God is longing. And the Bible says God's looking across the earth, looking for the opportunity to show himself to those people whose hearts are loyal towards him. And so God is sitting in heaven today looking at us, wanting to reveal himself to us individually and as a church together. And as the corporate church, the church beyond here. And so we can know the mind of God through prayer, Bible study, meditation, our service to God. The more we give ourselves freely and willingly to God, the more He reveals Himself to us. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because everyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and then Hebrews a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. And so what God says to us over and over in his word is that if we will seek him, if we will look for him, if we will, we will try to search out his heart and his mind, he will reveal himself to us. And as I think about that, and as I look at my own life, especially in the last while, and I say, you know, God, am I really, is my life honoring to you? Is my life pleasing to you? Am I, am I the person you want me to be? You know, as we start this new year, I think that's a great place to start. Asking God about you, your life, through his eyes, as he looks at you. I was thinking over Christmas, and it was a difficult Christmas, but we got through by the grace of God. I was thinking over Christmas, you know, we all admit that most of our world doesn't get Christmas, right? Don't you agree that most of our world doesn't get Christmas? It's a holiday, it's Santa Claus, it's family time, it's vacation time, it's whatever. But most of our world doesn't get the birth of Jesus Christ and why Jesus Christ came to earth. And God puts us as Christians here to help them come to know why Jesus Christ came. That's our job. That's our place. When we sincerely seek God, He will reveal Himself through the Holy Spirit. What purpose do we have to <coughs> seek God? Why should we seek God? Some people, and I heard a preacher say this just recently, and I was just about ready to stand up, but I, I didn't. It was in the service. I heard a preacher say recently, Harry, sit down, because you're not going to like this either. He said, I just want to get in the door. I just want to get in the door. Wow, that's sad. How many of you as students did really well in school? Come on now, there had to be one or two of you. How many of you worked your very hardest and did everything you could to do the best you could do in school? How many of you, your parents or your teacher ever looked at you and said, you could do better, you're capable of doing a lot better than you're doing? Any of you? Oh, well, that number, that number jumped. That number jumped. You know something? I believe God's looking at us today and saying, you capable of doing more. Capable of doing better. Capable of being a better Christian. Capable of being a better son or daughter of mine. In his weak, in our weaknesses, he's made strong. And you know, we, we've got to that place, some of us, that we make so many excuses. We're older, tired, we're worn out, we're frazzled, we've had too many aches and pains, we're too busy. Maybe we need to rearrange some of those priorities. 
But it really bothers me, and I think it bothers God, when he looks at us and we're just content to get in the door. Just as long as I get in the door. As long as my coattails don't get burnt with the flames. You know, as long as I'm not just getting out of hell. Well, that's what a lot of people take it. They just want to make sure they don't go to hell. Well, that's a pretty noble goal. But you notice what Paul says here in Philippians? Paul says, I want the highest prize. I want first place. I don't want second or third or fourth or fifth or twenty-fifth or whatever. I want the first prize. I want to be up front. I want to be the best for God that I can possibly be. When I walk in heaven's gate, I want God to look at me and be pleased with my life. Not just squeak in the door and step off to the side, just get in. But actually God say to me, well done. There is no prize in life or eternity greater than those who will hear God say to them, well done. And Paul presses for that. He presses for the highest prize, the highest calling in Christ Jesus because that's what Jesus has called him for. He's not satisfied with just getting in. He wanted all there was to be his best. Ask yourself, do I want to just get in or do I want the top prize? Am I satisfied with just passing? Or do I want to be the very best I can possibly be? In verse 7 through 8 in Philippians 3, Paul uses a word. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider, consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. What's God worth to you? What's Jesus worth to you? Jesus dying on the cross, coming on Christmas as we celebrated, dying on the cross and raising from the dead. What's that worth to you? That's a question I have to ask myself. What is it worth to me? Because the worth of that will determine what I'm willing to give to it. Most people sitting here worked hard all their lives to get a home, to acquire some savings if possible. We did it so we could get a little bit easier when we got older. It was worth a lot to us, so we worked hard at it. But in comparison to everything that you have in this world, and the worth and the value of that, what is the worth and the value of Jesus Christ to you? You see, Paul said, and I believe it should be the same in our lives, that all of the things of this world that we've attained are only a very small value compared to the worth of knowing Jesus Christ. You just ask some of the older people how fast the life passes. It goes by pretty quick. And we put all of that energy into this life and a few years at the end of this life in retirement maybe. But yet there's all of eternity 
all of eternity in the investment of Jesus Christ. So which one really, which prize really is worth pursuing? Paul writes, the worth. And then in verse 10, that verse that tugs at my heart every time I read it, he says this, I want to know the power of his resurrection, participation in his sufferings, and become like him in his death. In that one verse, he says three things. I want to know the power of his resurrection. Peter writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Every person that comes to Jesus Christ and opens up their heart and their life and invites Christ to come in to be their Savior and their Lord. Notice I said two words, Savior and Lord. They're inseparable. You can't have them as Savior if you don't have them as Lord. Some people seem to think you can, but you can't. If you invite Jesus Christ into your life to be your Savior and your Lord, He comes in by His Spirit, and you experience the power of His resurrection as your sin is wiped away. And you stand pure before God in Jesus Christ. That's to experience the power of his resurrection. His death, burial, and resurrection was to purify sin, was to deal with the penalty and the price of sin in our world, in our lives. And to every person who comes to saving faith in Christ, they experience the power of his resurrection. Because it's the power of resurrection that saves them. But Paul says, that's not enough. That's not enough. I don't want to stop there. That's not good enough for me. I want more. And so he says, I want to experience the power of his resurrection, but I want to participate in his sufferings. Now we're heading into different territory. I want to participate in his sufferings. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Paul says it's not just enough to experience forgiveness. That's not enough. There's got to be more. I want more. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to experience Jesus in a greater way. I want to participate in his sufferings. And Paul says, I urge you, brothers, that every day that you wake up, you look at God and you say, God, here I am. Here's my life. Here's everything that I am, I have. It's yours. What do you want me to do with it? Put it on the altar of sacrifice. Paul could have coasted through life. He reached a position with the Pharisees that he had it pretty easy. He could have coasted through life. He could have coasted through life as a Christian. But he wasn't happy coasting through life. He wanted it all. <clears throat> when he realized what Jesus Christ had done for him, He couldn't settle for less. He had to have it all. And he would wake up in the morning and he would look at God and he'd say, here I am. What do you want me? How can I serve you? How can I give my life for you? And he did that because of his love for Jesus Christ. But you know something else? He did it because he loved his neighbors. And he loved the Israelites and the Jews and the people around him. He writes in Romans chapter 10. He says, I would that I myself would be accursed for my brethren, the Jews. He was so overtaken by the lostness of his, of his people, of the people that he knew and that he lived with and he grew up with and he, and he was living life and he was so overtaken with their lostness that he, would, he, he wanted them to, even if it cost him his own, he wanted them to come to find Christ. Read the first couple of verses in Romans chapter 9 and chapter 10. You'll find out the heart of Paul. 
for the people that he grew up with and lived with. To see, to participate in his sufferings. And we don't know what it is to suffer. Not really. If you're very truthful, most of us don't know what it is to sacrifice. To give it all. How many of us really truly can relate to the lady who put the last penny in? Really, seriously. Not too many of us. How many of us really can relate to the disciples, the early disciples, who left their homes, their families, and everything to go? <clears throat> Participation in his sufferings. Give it all to him. And then he says, to be like him in his death. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 38, whatever, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. You see, Christianity is not a religion of traditions and pomp and pageantry and certain services. Christianity is a relationship with the living God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Christianity is a relationship where we seek God with all of our hearts and walk in His will for our lives. Where each day we give our lives, we seek to learn more about Him, we invite Him to draw us closer to Himself every day, we give Him control of our wills, our lives, asking Him to lead us in His will for our lives. The reason being, is that we should be motivated to the highest prize and the greatest calling there is in Christ Jesus. The giving of our total lives to Him as He gave His to us. You see, Jesus gave everything. He's our example. And He calls those of us who follow to give our everything. On this first Sunday of 2020, can we make it our goal as individuals and as a church to be all that Jesus wants us to be? To live for the prize of the highest calling in Christ Jesus? Let me close with verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Could we make that our goal? Father, we come to you this morning and we admit to you and we confess to you that that has not always been the goal of our life. It has not always been our aim to put you first, to give everything that we are and have to serve you. Father, here on this first Sunday in 2020, we want it to be the goal of our life. We want it to be the prize that we strive for, the highest calling in Christ Jesus, of giving our lives totally and completely to you. Granted, Father, by the power of your spirit and your strength, that you would enable us to do that through the days of this year. We pray in Jesus' name.
we go from this place this day. We would go with the anointing of your Holy Spirit. We would go with the surrendering of our minds and our hearts and our wills to your will. And may we walk with you by the power of your Spirit through the days of this week. In Jesus' name.